Hi, everybody. Um, I guess the first thing to say is we're going to go for about an hour, and it's definitely not a lecture. Um, I'm not sure what a lecture is anymore, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things that we can uh, think about. Or let's say it's one of the things that if we don't think about it, then we're idiots. And I think maybe the small group that we gather together now, we're trying not to be um, idiots in this moment. And um, so it's not a lecture. It's, a, it's more like a kind of intimate conversation, uh, almost sort of bedroom to bedroom or room to room. Um, and, and I wasn't sure what to talk about. I mean, of course, it's... Uh, precisely not business as usual right now. Uh, for example, in just in New York, somebody's dying of the virus every two minutes. Um, so it's not business as usual, right? So, so the idea that we would uh, uh, just carry on or do lectures and so on, or speak about architecture in the same way would seem almost like an insult uh, to the people who are really uh, suffering. Uh, I guess that's kind of obvious. Uh, maybe less obvious. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, not it is business as usual. Uh, the people that are dying are exactly correlating to people who struggle the most in our society. So in a certain sense, what we are experiencing is not a kind of aberration, but a kind of accentuation or, or intensification of the world that we already live in. So actually, it could be that um, so many people are interested to say, like, what will change and that we will all be different and nothing will be the same. Of course, these kinds of statements are usually the preludes to everything remaining uh, exactly the same. Uh, the kind of thing we, if we could tell ourselves that this is a crisis, for example, then, and crisis is a medical term, right? It comes from this, uh, this moment, crisis is the moment in which you might live, you might die, right? So uh, often people who talk about crisis usually talk about crisis because they're very interested in restoring uh, the status quo. But if you think of the crisis as not so much a crisis, but as, as, an, as a kind of intensification of what's already going on, then returning to business as usual uh, is the most difficult thing. So I would suggest that we don't take the attitude of uh, that this is not business as usual, nor simply the attitude that it is business as usual, but sort of try to think in the middle. And I think given that most of us are, are architects, and by the way, we're not really sure what that means, uh, or let's say an architect or an interesting architect would be anyone, someone who's not certain what architecture is. Architecture would be for us, something uncertain. Maybe for everybody else in society, architecture is precisely certain and not just certain, but like a kind of image of certainty, like the way we represent certainty. But maybe an architect is the only person in society for whom architecture is uncertain or even represents a certain amount of uncertainty. Right? So for us, architecture, let's say, is a question. Everybody else, it's a kind of answer. Actually, they come to us expecting us to give them architecture as an answer, which we hate to do. Uh, or if we do it, it's some kind of internal conflict. So I think uh, in this moment, just a small group of us together could think a little bit, um, and it's a time to think, right, to challenge our assumptions about architecture, maybe even to challenge, like if, if we had this image of ourselves as so questioning of architecture and so open um, to changing our understanding, and certainly uh, GSAP is a kind of model of this kind of laboratory for changing attitudes. If we're so proud of this uh, thing, maybe we have to also be careful what it is that we routinely, business as usual, don't uh, change. Uh, and that means like thinking through the sort of theoretical, technical, social, historical, conceptual, thinking it through every aspect uh, of our field. And that's why I thought maybe we could talk about um, Gordon Matter Clark. So let me try to bring you some images. I'm hoping that you're seeing this. Um, I'll maybe I open the chat that way if you if it's really a nightmare, you can't see it, you'll let me know. So, so why Matter Clark? Well, firstly, firstly, um, if you don't know the work of Matter Clark and you're in architecture, then you are an idiot. Um, just that's a very simple definition. Uh, an idiot in architecture is somebody that doesn't know the work of Matter Clark. Maybe you join this session because you do know Matter Clark or want to know Matter Clark. I can't yet decide if you're an idiot or not. But let's say if, if we're interested in reducing stupidity in architecture, Matter Clark would be an incredibly important place to start. I mean, this person, right? It doesn't seem to exactly represent um, the virtues of, uh, uh, of architectural restraint, of comfort, security, protection, all these things that we associate with architecture. Of course, Matter Clark is always understood to be an artist. Everybody knows, I suppose, that he studied architecture at Cornell and then became an artist. 
And of course, we think that art is interesting and architecture is boring. And because he's interesting, he must be an artist, not an architect. So the reason that we don't allow him to be an architect, right? he could be, let's say, an architect trained at Cornell who took his architectural understanding and displaced art or disturbed art with architecture. In other words, it could be what's radical about him is that he's an architect, not an artist. But we tend to have this kind of self-deprecating idea about our own field, that if he's so hardcore interesting, then we must have lost him to the field of art. And the field of art is even more questioning and even more destabilizing um, than our own field. But again, look at this image. Of course, it's, you know, this is 1972. This is the project called Hair. These are photographs by his then girlfriend, Caroline Gooden, who was a photographer. After uh, one year of growing his hair, he has it then kind of stretched out and photographed like that. But I could suggest to you that only an architect would have their hair placed into this kind of grid. In other words, the, the, the kind of claim of architecture on order is still there. In fact, if you look at it from the back, he's in some kind of prison of architecture. He's absolutely inside geometry. So this image you saw before, which is the wild man, the wild artist, the young, crazy, dyslexic, uh, alcoholic, um, uh, kind of um, transgressive figure, is in fact some, somewhat imprisoned in a kind of system of calculation and so on. So all the complexity of the hair is actually being kind of counted. Uh, it's a kind of census of his hair. This is not really um, uh, a kind of reggae. Uh, um, uh, this is not a kind of a, uh, marijuana um, Matt Clark, although of course marijuana was, was one of his many things. But it is, it is almost like a kind of uh, an architectural knowledge of the world of uh, hair. So I warn you, uh, not so easily, even in the moment of the greatest wildness, that this figure is so simply um, an artist. And why do we tell that story? Here, here he is at the age of 13 at the beach, and behind him, on his shoulder, and you know, things on your shoulder weigh, tend to weigh very heavily, is his father, and fathers tend to weigh extremely heavily, especially this one, uh, Roberto Mata, uh, the famous surrealist artist. But then again, I just did the same thing because Matta himself was an architect, worked with Le Corbusier and so on, and then became more famous as a surrealist painter. Again, so we have a, a young architect who will become an artist, repeating the pattern of his father, his father who never showed any respect to him and, and Matta Clark's entire life was trying to impress his father, and the only thing he really ever did that impressed his father was to die very young. And in the moment he died, his father then said, my son, the great uh, uh, artist. So again, this kind of torment between architecture and art. Of course, this is the matter, Clark, you know, somebody that's tormenting architecture, like cutting it out here in Paris, 1975, making this whole, like a kind of a telescope. So you could look up through a building from the street and you could look down uh, uh, to Paris. Or here, Office Brock, 1977, uh, in Antwerp. Again, a sort of geometrical dissection or a kind of disruption of architecture by architecture, like architecture inside architect, not just the architect inside, but architecture, let's say, uh, inside of itself, producing this sort of be beginning to develop. You can sense here a room that has been violated, by, but not violated by some kind of uh, uh, irregular transgressive animal, but actually violated by geometry. So here, actually, the disturbance has been caused by, by, by order, by geometric uh, order. And there's kind of Matta Clark um, accidentally, although there is never such a thing as an accidental photograph of an architect or an artist, sort of lounging in this uh, uh, disruption. And then eventually we get to his last work, 1978 in Chicago Circus, in which actually it's impossible to determine which is the geometry of the building and which is the geometry of the cuts into the, into the building. So why, of course, these are celebrated as amongst the most important works of 20th century art. And if you're a student in art, you must study Matta Clark. It's not uh, optional. Interesting that, right? Matta Clark is optional in architecture, but not optional in art. If, for example, you're a major art museum, you must have Matta Clark in your collection. He's a canonic figure. He's even the figure of a kind of artist's artist in the same way that other a very small set of figures like uh, Marcel Duchamp and others. Not by accident, Marcel Duchamp, uh, his kind of familial uh, god li literally, of course, close friend of his father and all of that, a childhood uh, uh, mentor. And there's a lot of Duchamp uh, in Matta Clark. And so if I'm arguing too, there's a lot of architecture in Matta Clark, maybe we have to think that there's also a lot of uh, architecture in Duchamp, which of course there, there, there is. Anyway, looking at, looking at these astonishing images, which are kind of images of vertigo, 
But what is, what is vertiginous here, what is spinning out of control, is not the subject, it's not like a human placed within this geometry, but architecture itself has, as it were, uh, lost its uh, 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 bearings. Now, I, I have, uh, obsess about Metaclark, so this is, of course, when I say to you to not know about Metaclark is to be an idiot, of course, I'm trying to prevent the possibility that I, I'm the idiot by virtue of being obsessed with Metaclark. I did a show in GSET many, many years ago, which led up to this book, which came out a couple of years ago, on an architecture, of course, the sort of central, uh, one of the central concepts of Metaclark. But more recently, I did another exhibition in Shanghai at the power station called Passing Through Architecture, the 10 Years of Metaclark. This show opened at the end of last year, then closed because of the virus, and then kind of reopened when Shanghai reopened, and, and then it sort of finally closed. So it was a kind of exhibition in the age of the uh, uh, virus. And of course, I'm interested in um, the relationships between the work of Metaclark, let's say, and the work of the uh, virus, right? The, the way the virus occupies the inside of your body, takes over control and reorganizes the geometry, the genetic geometry and the cellular uh, geometry. But I don't mean it here like as a kind of a metaphor, like, oh, um, look at the virus, perhaps there's something viral, viral about Metaclark. Now I mean it a little bit the other way around, that perhaps if we were to think a little bit more carefully about Metaclark's work, we might think about a virus in a different way. Right? So it's not about uh, kind of art as a, as a kind of piece of evidence or representation of something that's, let's say, biological. I'm interested in Metaclark's biological thinking. And, and in particular, the main theory of this exhibition was to argue that Metaclark's, um, and it's kind of this book, this book is, uh, which is huge, by the way, um, don't look at it, you could never find it or buy it or even carry it, it's a monster. And of course, one of its admissions is to kill the previous book, to criticize the previous book. So this takes a kind of biological view uh, of the building cuts. And that might seem at first counterintuitive, like he's cutting through buildings very, very precisely, very much as an architect, architect, cutting with architecture into architecture. But I want to argue that his mindset was fundamentally uh, uh, biological. Anyway, here's Matter Clark. He's at Cornell. Uh, by the way, he was not a terrible architecture student. Again, we assume that if he's like really radical and hardcore and interesting, then he must have been a bad or rebel architecture student. No, he's not just a good architecture student. He won all the prizes in his graduating year. He was the favorite uh, uh, student. You see him there in the studio of Cornell. He doesn't look so certain, right? He looks at us over his shoulder. He looks directly at us. He hides his face a little bit behind his uh, 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 shoulder. We don't know, by the way, whether he's kind of wanting to get out or go back in. He's, he's like at the threshold to the studio. You see in the distance of the studio is Le Corbusier's modular man kind of hanging there as a kind of representative of architecture in its place. Notice that he's sitting beside the tools of architecture, the triangle, the drawing board and so on, but actually there's no drawing there. And then you look at the wall beside him and there's a white wall um, and there's no, nothing hanging on it. But there are these two holes and these holes maybe are little enigmatic clues as to his future life of somebody cutting. But the main point here is we don't know if he's just passing through architecture, like he's going to school and then he's gonna become an artist. He was doing classes in sculpture at the same time as he was doing architecture. Maybe he always wanted to be an artist or maybe he wants to go uh, deeper into, into architecture. We know that, as I showed you before, uh, in the famous Meta Clark, so this is the Meta Clark, the architect, uh, an unknown, uh, uh, a picture that I found in the archive. And this is a very famous uh, a picture of Metaclark poised between the inside and the outside of a building, uh, carving into the building, a kind of a daredevil thrill seeker, very physical, very macho. So, so a kind of quiet, timid, cautious, uh, not sure at the threshold of architecture. And again, a uh, kind of a um, uh, uh, macho image of somebody also at the threshold, but seemingly now uh, in, in control of the threshold. And of course, we would, be, we would be normally thinking in these kinds of terms, like young, delicate, thoughtful, not sure, gives way to older, stronger, more confident, more decisive, more famous, unknown image, known image, this, this sort of trajectory. I think part of what I want to suggest to you is that this very, very timid figure let's say, is, is, the, is the real Metaclark, or to, or to put it another way around, he was an extraordinarily delicate uh, 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 creature, some, so, something like this. But first, I guess we have to ask ourselves, 
I mean, a kind of a core question, which is like, what does it mean to pass through architecture? Right? Like, how do you pass through architecture? You can see in this image, of course, it's passing through because the, the wind and the light passes through, but also insects pass through, right? Vibrations pass through, bacteria passes through, viruses uh, uh, pass through, uh, thoughts pass through, people pass through, pets pass through, uh, uh, pipes pass through, wires pass through, electrical signals pass through, radio passes through, television passes through. The very ability for us to have this conversation is premised on the idea that these signals could pass through the rooms that you're in, rendering those rooms somewhat irrelevant in the moment of this creation of another kind of room or another kind of architecture in which we have this meeting. In other words, passing through architecture is uh, what's happening, let's say, all the time. It happens when you're in a, in a room and just by chance you can see through a door and through that door you can see through a window and you see a tree in the distance. So there is this kind of uh, 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 perforation of architecture that is, let's say, uh, uh, routine. I would argue that, that Meta Clark's mission was to pass through architecture. That means not to uh, change it or to change it only by going through it. So as it were, when you look at the work of Meta Clark, you're looking at like a kind of turbulence, like the turbulence in the wind or a smell, right? A smell is a great example of, of, of some, somehow passing through. By the way, all of these things, sort of a smell, vibrations, insects, pet, dirt, by the way, the dirt that comes in underneath your shoes into a house, uh, uh, excessive wind, all these things are kind of like the enemy of architecture. You get taught in architecture school how to remove those things. If you uh, suggest that uh, you would like to have more insects inside your house, you are likely to lose that commission. By the way, keep an eye on uh, Lena Bobadi. Um, and uh, Hannes Meyer, both of whom felt that uh, d what they called domestic insects were an absolutely vital uh, uh, part of architecture. So there are, are of course, counter uh, uh, theories. Anyway, to pass through, to pass through like the wind. Here's what Meta Clark does immediately after uh, leaving architecture school. So we're in his loft uh, in New York. He hangs a kind of cauldron from the ceiling. You see it there. And into this cauldron, he places a kind of gelatinous uh, a mess and puts it in, into it all sorts of foodstuffs and so on. He basically makes bacteria. So he's interested in breeding uh, uh, bacteria. You see, he's sticking his finger into this. Apparently, the smell was so intense, speaking about smell, that nobody could enter the room while he was in that room. If you look at the wider room around him, you can see that there are plants hanging on the walls, that there are a kind of what look like sort of skins lying on the floor. These are skins. You see it maybe more clearly here. These are skins coming out of this bowl. There are the gas burners that are bubbling this way. He's doing kind of chemical work. So, so literally, Meta Clark begins his work uh, uh, by doing kind of biological work. This seems to be the exact opposite of Cornell. You know, white architecture, super white, whiter than modern architecture ever was, super ge geometric. This seems to be the opposite of geometry. These things dry into these kind of gooey, smelly, uh, kind of uh, ho horrific. It's kind of like, uh, it's almost like the revenge on Cornell. It's like kind of anti-white architecture. It's like shitting on, on, uh, on Cornell. By, by the way, there are um, many reasons uh, why shitting on, on, uh, on that particular brand of modern architecture is, is an honorable uh, activity. Here it is happening quite literally. And you see the pans, the sort of metal pans are lying on the floor and they are being in a certain, certain way exhibited. So this is not just anti-architecture. It's also anti-art. This is, this is art that if you look at it, you also breathe it in. When you look at this art, you breathe in the bacteria which it, of, from which it is being made. It's also art that evolves. It keeps getting smaller and it keeps desiccating and moving into the air. But it is also, as it were, on the floor, kind of, and again, not on the walls, but on the floor, framed like a kind of painting. And look at how this, this uh, uh, is lined up with the floorboards. Uh, 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 in his studio. And even you could say the fact that it has been photographed already indicates that this is anti-art, of course, as itself a form of art. Here it is a sort of shrinking in to a kind of uh, blanket. If you were to touch this fabric, it would uh, uh, dis disintegrate. Uh, there are the rejects on the left. You see kind of pans with all sorts of congealed messes and mixing with plants. There's a lot of plant life. There's a lot of biological elements added in, but also a lot of food. You see on the right that he's very fascinated with when this kind of congealed substance starts to look not so different from a kind of the congealed quality of the brick wall uh, of his studio. Here's one of the pieces on the floor of the studio. It's a kind of mixture. 
of plants uh, 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 and, and this kind of uh, fungus. He said at the time that he was mainly interested in, a, in infection, what he called wholesale infection. He imagined, for example, that there could be a huge gelatin mess like this that would form the whole of the Hudson River, that the whole Hudson River would be this enormous uh, bacteriological uh, experiment. But look at it on the floor. It seems like impossible to touch, impossible to move. But here is exactly the same piece now in the basement of the gallery of 112 Green Street in Soho, which of course is famously the site of kind of downtown productions. This is the very first time he's occupying the space and you see he's reconstructed that work as best he can. Again, it's on the floor. It doesn't look like art. It looks like something that should be cleaned away. It looks like garbage. It looks like a rest. There's a kind of a confusion here. So anti-art is not just a visual thing or an aesthetic thing. It's also an exhibition thing, a way of occupying space, zooming in more closely on it. Again, it looks like a kind of dead skin of some kind of uh, uh, animals. Then he has his first uh, solo exhibition. First time he's exhibited here in the Bicart Gallery. And you see he's taken that vine that was hanging on the wall of his studio. He now hangs it between two walls of the gallery. And, and there are all of these various kind of biological specimens hanging there. He provided for the visitors to the gallery a microscope so that you could look at the organisms growing, uh, the fungus and bacteria growing within this, a kind of like a, a laboratory uh, experiment. The first of these works was uh, sold. The first time he ever sold a work, it was bought by Holly Solomon. And several people refused to have dinner in her house because they were afraid of getting infected by this work, which was hanging near the dining table. Uh, Richard Serra, the sculptor, reached out and touched it and it simply disappeared. And she thought it was great, was absolutely uh, wonderful. He then starts to make, to being an architect, he designs the equipment to make the brews in which he's going to make bacteria. You see it on the left, kind of gas burner. And then he starts to fill these trays. Now he's up in the ground floor for a group show again in the 112 Green Street. And you can see his kind of cooking equipment is placed beside. The exhibition includes the pans, the biological material, which you see kind of shrinking, the, the, the stove in which it's cooked, even the bucket with which it was then poured and the brush with which it's then stirred. So it's again a very, very uh, never underestimate uh, Metaclark's, the complexity of Metaclark's exhibitions. This is a quote from him at that time. I'm more interested in synthesizing life than in making art. So basically he was trying to make life, like organic uh, uh, biological life. I take this uh, quote uh, uh, very serious uh, uh, as a basis of the work. By the way, that mix in 112 Green Street turned out to be, uh, to explode. Uh, it literally was alive, it literally exploded. Here it is just after the, the explosion. You see that one piece of the tray has moved to the right. There's been a huge fire and they've tried to move it apart. Uh, you see on the left, he then takes those pans, rearranges them in the street in the same pattern that they were in the gallery, but then as you see on the right, sort of sets fire to them and then photographs it. So once again, even the destruction of the work becomes uh, uh, part of the work. And there you see after the work is finished, there is a dumpster full of garbage. So a classic piece of architecture, right? A perfect geometry, a rectangle, in which is all of this garbage. Then there are his, his cooking uh, uh, equipment and he's portraying a kind of synergy or, or he, he's, he's refusing to make a distinction between the dumpster, what's inside the dumpster, what is inside the dumpster, architecture, right? Uh, all, the, all the actual building materials, the wall, the floors, but also cartons, equipment, kitchen equipment and so on. So architecture is as it were in a dumpster and he starts to think that of course dumpsters are really architecture and, and that the garbage in them is architecture and this becomes the basis of his future work. The next time he exhibits, is, is this project, it has no name. It was in a, in a group show. Uh, over the course of 12 days, he walked the streets outside the church in which this was exhibited and picked up garbage. And every day he placed garbage into a wooden frame and you can see it slowly building up. There are 12 layers of garbage. He then removed the, the walls. You see, you see the sides falling down. You end up with this kind of geometric figure that's perfectly geometrical. It's architectural, it's a kind of a wall. By the way, you meet this wall when you walk in the front door. You have no choice, you have to go around it. It's big, it's smelly, it's full of, uh, 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 it's a kind of disorganization of material. It's everything rejected from civilized life, everything rejected from architecture. It's the kind of architectural rejects, which like in the return of the repressed have been pulled back into the house and reformed to make a house, a kind of a wall. So he's actually making geometry out of its other. He's making architecture about what seems to be uh, its other. 
Again, these are the drawings that then led to the idea that he could do two of these walls outside a church in downtown New York. Uh, and you see it that on the left, it starts out with the idea that you could build a roof to the dumpster. The roof would be kind of biological. So these drawings are a kind of confusion of architecture and uh, 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 biology. You see on the left, the dumpster is a kind of wall making machine. And on the right, you have two walls, a dining table, and a hammock for sleeping on. And the idea is that artists would make performances and they would cook and you would live and you would live in the street. And, and he called the project homesteading. It was about constructing a new idea of domesticity. This is domesticity made out of the rejects of domesticity. So if for example, in the Zoom meeting, we have all, as it were, withdrawn to our domestic spaces, like kind of animals returning to our uh, dens. Imagine that your den would be made out of what has been rejected from, from architecture. Architecture literally made out uh, of its other. He then does many, many drawings of which I'm just showing you a few when, in which he imagines that architecture can be made out of garbage. More specifically, that architecture would be biological. These are all composting systems. So you feed the garbage in at the top and it slowly works its way down and you have a kind of loose metal frame which is holding these things uh, together. He then in this next exhibition makes such a wall and gives it now the name Garbage Wall. This is a more well-known project underneath the uh, 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 Brooklyn Bridge. You see him there and you see the wall is now, uh, it's not simply uh, a wall that the geometry is coming from itself, but coming from this kind of metal grid with plaster on one side, metal grid on the other. He has this idea, this, uh, this particular part of Brooklyn Bridge, there are a lot of uh, what we were yet to be called homeless, but would be, would be eventually called homeless people. So this was his idea of a possible future for architecture. Again, the image is the image of a grid. This is not so different from the image of his hair that I showed you at the beginning, right? This is an image of a kind of perfect grid, which is containing not just order, but as it were, a sort of disorder. It's also, you could say, a kind of vitrine, a kind of artistic uh, uh, display of the other, of the economy, of, the, uh, of waste, turned into, into sort of uh, utilization. Just to give you a better sense, you see him making the wall. What they did here was to dig a hole and assemble the wall beside the hole, lift the wall up, drop it down and fill it in. So you get the image as you see on the right. So here he is like now sort of smoothing the plaster on the outside of the wall. But also he returns to the site to photograph the wall fallen down flat. I suspect he's the one that pushed it flat because just as this wall is made out of recycled garbage, even the wall that has been recycled must itself be recycled in a kind of uh, uh, continuous uh, process. So this image, this kind of portrait of Meta Clark with a kind of metal grid picking up garbage is absolutely crucial to understanding the way that he thinks architecture. He's not thinking of garbage as simply the other, but as the very possibility of the production uh, of architecture. These are just to show you some typical photographs of him. He's always interested in that moment in which uh, uh, organization, architectural organization, has a kind of intimate relationship with what seems to be its other. This can mean kind of literal garbage, but it can also mean, for example, the recycling of buildings. He was fascinated by this building, which is being lifted up to be moved somewhere else. For him, a city is exactly the same as that little wall he made. It's con constantly turning over in a kind of biological life. Cities are like or, or organisms. So just as he's interested in, on the image on the left, on a building deliberately lifted up to be moved away, he's fascinated by a building literally falling down uh, in his own neighborhood, as you see uh, uh, on the right. Then when he goes back into uh, Green Street, he produces this work and you see it's a kind of diagonal shelter underneath an old lift shaft. One half is filled with bottles, the other half is filled with compost and he's making mushrooms and growing plants. So again, a kind of literal confusion uh, uh, of organic and, and technological. And from those bottles, he makes these glass bricks. So once again, it's about recycling, throwing away the bottles, by the way, all came from Brooklyn. So he would gather the bottles from Brooklyn, bring them to Soho, and eventually he would start melting them into bricks. So again, here you get geometric form, as it were, constructed out of a kind of confusion of geometry or what appears to be the opposite of geometry. And again, there is this sort of uncanny sense of, uh, uh, of a kind of otherness. Um, but I'm trying to suggest to you, this is not for him otherness. This is the deep heart, let's say, of architecture. He's making architecture out of uh, recycled automobiles, literally again as kind of housing. He's also covering the housing with plants. There is a relentless confusion of architecture and plants. All of his drawings involve at that time, 
1971 involve what looked like kind of architectural structures, even you could say architectonic structures, uh, in, a, in a kind of loving, intimate, and confused relationship with plants, whether they be floating on the river like this. And he starts to imagine hanging from a tree. These are some of his first drawings uh, for tree dance. Uh, and again, you can see that he's trying to make a kind of cocoon where the space for the human would be something like the space for an animal, or at least the space would be look like a kind of extension of the tree rather than something added to the tree. So here it's kind of imagined, and you see it on the right. He's living in that space with a few friends uh, uh, for a day, dreaming of being in a tree. You can be sure that when Matt Clark uh, dreams, he dreams of trees. Here he is, not exactly the heroic artist, right? This is somebody, he's sort of hanging in the cocoon of his own art. This is a much more delicate uh, uh, kind of woven image. This is the artist kind of, uh, let's say, woven into place as an animal, and a, a tree animal. Uh, this was his kind of dream. When he draws that project, you see the drawing on the right, but the way he draws the tree is to make it seem, let's say, a little bit more geometric. And the way he draws his uh, uh, additions to the tree are a little bit organic. So the drawing is a very, very uh, beautiful confusion uh, of architecture and, and biology. And I want to insist on that. I show you a few drawings just, just so you don't think this is just sort of casual. Look at the drawing on the left. It's a confusion of architecture, automobiles, and plants. On the right, you, at first you might say it's kind of like a zoo where there are some trees, but the trees are half inside the zoo and half outside, and part of the zoo is made by trees. So you could also say that the architecture is inside the trees or the trees inside the architecture. I'm not really interpreting the drawing for you. I'm just describing uh, the image. Look at them. They are very, very calculated images of a kind of refusal to allow the organic or the technological gain some kind of advantage and trying to suggest not just a symbiotic relationship between them, but a kind of confusion uh, uh, between the two, as you see on the left and on the right. And by the way, he has measurements for these. The idea of these projects, these should be six stories high. These, he's, he is drawing buildings, right? Um, 1971. By the way, if you do that now, you get all sorts of bonus points for being ecological and sensitive. You don't get any bonus points for being transgressive. This is not understood as trans transgressive, but transgressive uh, it was. Environmental it was, ecological uh, uh, it was. I show you now some drawings. There are, there are two sets of Matt Clark drawings which are never shown. He never showed them and nobody wanted to see them. Uh, the first is a set of incredibly delicate drawings of plants. Nobody wants to see them because nobody wants Matt Clark to be a delicate, more feminine, more uncertain, more, you could say, beautiful person, right? We want this macho cutter. We want the violence, quite literally, the violence. We want the relationship with architecture not to be a loving relationship, but let's say a con conflictual one. So, so artists don't want to see these drawings, and especially architects don't want to see this. So these are, these are like forbidden drawings for architecture and art. He was doing them all the time, by the way, uh, through a succession of close uh, friends and uh, they all said it was very difficult to talk to him because he would always be doing these drawings as if daydreaming. At first they just looked like, you know, plants. There's some weirdness to them. But the more you look, the weirder they are. You notice that actually the, tr the, the, the trunk gets thicker as it goes up rather than smaller. And again, there's a kind of, not just a hint of geometry, but geometry is sort of embedded there. You get a kind of sex between trees. And by the way, if you're into trees, uh, without sex between trees, it's all over, right? But the trees are also somehow forming architecture. Architecture becomes, you know, and it, and it makes, doesn't make any sense to say this is a grid in which trees are growing, or the trees are, as it were, growing a grid. Uh, the drawing is drawn in such a way to resist that. Same with this drawing. There are maybe some, some right angles that we would claim for architecture and some non-right angles that we would see as organic, but can you be so certain of, of that uh, distinction? Yeah, you could hang geometry between trees, for sure. But what are you gonna do now? What are you gonna do when the tree is more geometrical than you? Like here, the, the branches go out, form, and then there's a ring form, right? I mean, we were talking the other day with some students about a tree is not a tree, city is not a tree. The interesting thing is that a tree is not a tree either. Look at this, right? And you see this kind of vortex of energy, kind of like a big sort of dynamo. And this sort of intersection of pure force. And the word energy is coming up again and again and again in his thinking. He's very, very interested in energy. Whatever passing through architecture means, it's something about energy and the flows of energy. 
the fact that I can take some garbage, make a wall, and that that wall will return to the city in a kind of endless cycle, which includes skyscrapers as well as uh, small cabins or homeless shelters. This is all a kind of a conversation about energy, and it is a kind of deliberately and viral sense of energy. And th these are the words that he's using: an infectious energy. Here again, a kind of now, 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 if I hadn't shown you the previous images, you might not have even imagined a tree. You might have just thought that this is a more kind of a geometric condition, a kind of a cross. But when you look inside the cross, the cross is precisely not made up out of crosses. Like, so you're getting, again, geometry out of what seemed to be its opposite. There's, a, again, a kind of confusion of which, day, which way does a tree grow. And soon you get a kind of urbanism. By the way, the drawings I'm showing you, I'm showing you chron chronologically. These drawings are very much kind of systematic ex ex explorations. And they're even a kind of vortex of energy. It's about a kind of psychedelic kind of uh, burst of energy. Uh, these drawings are, are undated, uh, unnamed. I mean, with some detective work, I, have, I can, can give you dates and so on, but it's important to know they are kind of like very, very private investigations, each one of which could be treated as a work of art. And by the way, these days they are treated like uh, uh, works of art. And in the end, it's just energy about energy, flows of energy, and flows of energy that very easily form architecture, right? As architects, very easy for us to see that there is architecture going on here. Okay, so I'm trying to make you the point that in his private life, let's say, in his drawings, if we can think of this as uh, private, but this whole question, what's public, what's private, maybe that's gonna be one of the victims of this argument, is all about this kind of confusion of architecture and trees. So again, I want to quickly show you that the building cuts uh, that see, again seem like geometry on geometry are really biology on biology. So here's the first cut. It's a hole made in the floor uh, of the gallery of 112 Green Street. And in that hole, he plants a cherry, street, cherry tree you see on the right. And in the dirt on the right, he's growing uh, grass and mushrooms. So again, it's a kind of a biological experiment. It's also technological. What nobody ever seems to notice about this drawing, there's actually a, a blueprint image of the tree on the left on the plywood in reverse, right? A kind of reverse image, literally like a blueprint. So there's a kind of image of a tree next to a tree. So it's also a confusion of, of let's say, technologies. That project, he then seals it up. So he reestablishes the hole. You still see the hole because there's a lead lining. You see the geometry, and he buries in the in this hole. It's a kind of tomb, a, a kind of grave for the cherry pits. So the organic life that was uh, uh, in that tree. By the way, this is still there. Just just you know, we're just a few about 100 meters away from this. It's still there, buried somewhere. One day there'll be some sort of art archaeology that will dig it up. And what Matter Clark says is that even though you don't have the hole anymore. The hole is in your mind because of this mark on the floor. He's very, very interested that when you think you're inside a space, you actually sense the spaces you cannot see, the sort of uh, hidden space. His whole life, he will look for those hidden spaces. He, now we're in 1977. In a gallery, he goes to the basement, digs a square hole, and every day just keeps digging lower and lower. And you can see him from the gallery above because he cuts the same hole, hole in the floor of the gallery. In other words, you walk into a gallery, it's a white cube, there's nothing there except for a hole. You look down through the hole, you see another hole, and in that hole you see the artist, almost as it were, burying himself. He's always interested. So what do you get? What's on exhibit in the gallery is what's inside the ground holding up the floor of the basement that holds up the gallery, the sort of secret structure, let's say, of the gallery. Also, at the same time, he's in the underground of Paris. Underneath all the famous monuments of Paris, he finds the shit and the sewers. Probably you can see from this image that the shape of the shit is very much the same as the shit that he was making to attack Cornell. So he's saying the beauty of Paris uh, uh, is, is, you know, like uh, based on this uh, uh, sort of smelly flow. Now to the cuts, right? The first cuts that could be recognized as cuts. This is the so-called sauna cut. He takes a horizontal uh, cut through his girlfriend's uh, sauna. Uh, probably not a good diplomatic move not a relationship that survived this cut. Uh, but notice how he cuts it. He cuts through the elect electricity and the wires so that you not only sense that there's a hole, but you sense, uh, let's say, the movement of the hole. You don't know whether this is going out or going in. These become objects sitting on the floor of his loft like this, and they move with him. These objects become like forensic slices uh, through the building, through the life of the building. At the end of 1971, he does an extremely complex cut in Chile, involved mirrors. Again, it's all about revealing the secret life of the building. He does the same thing in Boston with a show called Pipes in which he brings the hidden pipes into the gallery itself through cuts. 
And then he's starting now, starting in New York and Brooklyn. He makes here, for example, a kind of horizontal window by cutting through a corner and a door. And through this new window, I now see a room that I couldn't see before, and I see through it to a window on the other side. So for the first time, I realized that the window on the other side is also a cut. In other words, the way he cuts into architecture is to show you that architecture is made of cuts. He's doing it again and again. So here in the floor, these are very famous works. So I just show you, you probably know them. I show you very fast, looking from below. Of course, you get to see all sorts of forensic information about how this building is constructed, what the layers are and so on. But more importantly, the room in which you are standing and the room above are one and the same room. And then you're seeing through the door in the room above. So you are able to, as it were, pass through. So all, always what he's trying to do is to pass through architecture and to let your mind pass through. Again, just to show the cut. Uh, I'll give you another example. This is threshold. Obviously, he makes the cut right at a threshold. So now it's very, very complicated. Three, four rooms are placed into an intimate relationship they didn't have before. And we can see out through this window to the street and looking down, right, and through like the dog and looking up. It's incredibly complex work. But you can see from this one, it's not just that hole in the floor. In this unpublished photograph, you see he's a cut through, the, he's removed the floor from the floor below. Uh, this is his friend, the sculptor Susie Harris, who's down below. He's actually making a kind of a pyramid, a small hole at the top and a large hole at the bottom. Here's Susie Harris, like who was a real thrill seeker, lying across. She was much more courageous uh, uh, than Meta Clark. This is uh, for sure. If you don't know the work of uh, Suzanne Harris, I to totally recommend that you uh, see it. When he goes to do this uh, project in, in, in Italy, in Genoa, uh, the famous uh, uh, project, it's again the same thing. He cuts a small square in the top, removes the square, but then cuts a series of radial cuts uh, uh, through the side and through the bottom. Just to show you, if you don't think this is an architect at work, these are the drawings of that project, right? unbelievably clearly architectural. So when, for example, he cuts in his most famous work back in New Jersey, 1974, splitting, when he cuts through the building, this is very much uh, a cut made with the same uh, kind of interest in, in, in the kind of a biological. Again, I'm showing you now another set of drawings. These are the other drawings that are never shown of Meta Clark because uh, nobody wants him to be a delicate uh, artist, thoughtful, uncertain, unclear, uh, flower, tree lover, tree hugger. Nobody wants that, but also nobody wants him to be an architect. This is a, this is a great threat to architects because if he's really interesting, then that means most architects are not. And also, if he's a great threat to artists, because if an architect can be that interesting, what have they got? Right? So, this, so people don't like to see these drawings. But in all of these drawings, by the way, these are not drawings for a cut. These are, in his mind, already cuts. When he has made these drawings, he feels like the project is already done, and he moves on and makes another one. Many of these are considerably more radical than the cuts that he would do. Of course, they are the kinds of things that he would like to do. What about sliding a house sideways? Right, and so on. I mean, and again, no doubt, no doubt, uh, the work of an architect, the kind of confusion of what is architecture, what's holding what up, what is a, what is a floor, what is a wall, what can flip, what can stop, why not several houses, why not start with a vertical slot on the left and end up with a circular one on the right. Look at this amazing set of drawings for, for a possible um, 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 a kind of a installation of art, uh, a place for showing and working on art. In which, the, in which there's a kind of a spherical cut. And the spherical, as you see on the bottom left, the sphere is actually cutting through the sidewall as it radiates out. So this is not so much a house that has been uh, a kind of violated by a sphere. It's more like a sphere with a house attached to it. And if you think I'm exaggerating, look at, one of the, look at the drawing of one of the most famous works, Office Baroque in Antwerp. You see what his idea is to cut a sphere out of the corner. So he keeps everything of the sphere and removes everything you see in dark. So there will be actually a sphere that's made of the house itself. And then there'll be a gap between the sphere and the rest of the house. You see it here maybe more, more clearly. He was super, super fascinated with the idea of making a sphere um, that, in which architecture would hold. So again, I'll show you another of these kind of secret drawings. You get the feeling, right? Just constantly thinking how to cut a sphere into a corner into such a way that architecture would pass through itself. Right, again and again and again and again. You see, and, and look at how at some point the sphere, I guess what I'm trying to tell you, this is not a house with a sphere in it, but a sphere that's, let's, let's say, holding a house together. 
the sphere at a certain point decides that it can leave, right? It can move. And maybe in our head, we always think of spheres like that. That's why they are such science fiction creatures, right? The sphere is thought to be its own world, or it is the world, it is an image of the world. So it, it looks like it could live inside architecture, be, as it were, housed in architecture. But again, I invite you to consider these drawings in the reverse. This is a house like built on a sphere. When he does his final project, uh, 1978, uh, in Chicago, you see it's the same idea, the original drawing. The same idea is to have a sphere uh, cut out of the top corner, but also to have a kind of vertical sphere cut down on the left and a diagonal between them. And this is the work that results. Probably in terms of the argument that I'm giving you today, this is the most uh, uh, unbelievable, successful, brilliant work of Matt Clark. Uh, it's just astounding. There is re it's not just confusing about what's the original and what's the cut. Uh, these are as perfectly poised between what was there and what is added as anything that I've shown you yet. Again, just producing this impossibility. Maybe there's a figure there. In fact, it's Matt Clark himself, but we don't really know where he stands in this image or if we are looking at the image uh, the correct way up. Again, the, the same. So this, the, the, these projects of course, have a complexity and a density which leaves, which leaves anything that you've seen of the so-called New York Five from Cornell way, way, way behind, right? This is, this is a whole other level of revenge, you could say, uh, or you could say a whole other level of, 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 of kind of skill, of kind of a quality of, uh, of, of intensity. And, and here's Meta Clark making this cut. It was incredibly cold. It was a very, very cold winter. You have to be like some kind of animal to make the cut. He repeatedly described himself as some kind of uh, uh, animal. He was dying of cancer while making this cut. Uh, he didn't know. Uh, uh, he knew he was not well. Everybody knew he was not well. But this, the most amazing, most transgressive, uh, uh, astonishing work is made literally uh, uh, during this time. This is how cold it is. I mean, it's brutal. Chicago. You know, if you really think you can cut a building in the winter of Chicago, give it a, give it a try. Right. And, it, and of course, it was the sphere. This is, and, and, and now he knows he's, uh, he's really dying. He knows that um, uh, he has only some months to live, but he continues to draw. These are his projects for the Museum of Modern Art. This is not the Dillard Scafidio project. This is the Meta Clark uh, project. And you can see it's spheres inside spheres. Again, there are hundreds of drawings of this uh, project, which of course was far too interesting uh, for MoMA. This is the very last project, which is to take over a building in New York, uh, done for his, his very, very close friend and supporter, Alana Heiss. When she received this drawing, she could not stop crying because she knows that she's receiving uh, the drawing of a, of a dead person, soon to be dead person, but she replies that she's going to do her best to realize this project, which as you can see is yet again, a sphere uh, inside a house or a house inside a sphere. I just finished with these drawings. These are the drawings that Meta Clark made of his own cancer. You will recognize the sphere. You will rec if you look more closely, there is the sphere, which is the cancer itself, the cancer cells. And there are like little aircraft zipping around. These drawings are done the same year of Star Wars, the movie. Uh, so it is all about this little uh, fantasy of maybe shooting down the uh, Death Star. These are Death Stars, but they're also viral. They're also infected. Notice that they're also networked. They're all uh, linked together in a kind of a complex network in which the cells, there's a kind of plant which is linking them together. And then there are the little triangular uh, uh, ships that are trying to, as it were, unsuccessfully uh, destroy. But they, in fact, nothing can be separated out. So this is almost literally, uh, this is like the, one of the very, very last drawings that Meta Clark uh, will draw. And again, just to show you that there's this total fluidity between the plant, the biology, the life, the body, the brain, uh, and, and a kind of loss of, of, uh, of conventional architecture. Now we might be the last drawing. It might be. We are not sure. But the drawing is three phases. It's a history of trees. In the beginning, it says there were the trees and the end. And interestingly, look at the trees start off a little bit random, then they become sort of dense but a kind of geometry, even at the very end, is a kind of a right angle. So once again, at the very end, and describing the end, drawing the end, he draws in a way that it gives you the sense that right angles are born out of the sort of biological uh, life of trees. And I thought just to kind of give you a sense, 
So basically my argument is, is that it's super important, I think, to, to, see, to see this sense in which Meta Clark thinks biologically, which means ecologically, which means also a logic of kind of in, infection. It means also a logic of contagion and of, of invasion, but where the invader cannot be so simply separated from what uh, is being in, in, invaded. And in this case, the host is undoubtedly architecture, but I said undoubtedly architecture. And I started by claiming that what we have in common here in this conversation is we as architects, for us, architecture is full of doubt. So if I say the host is undoubtedly architecture, uh, what does it really mean? I show you this drawing, which is one of my favorites of Meta Clark. It, it seems at first that we are looking at a kind of cross-shaped hallway, which might have doors on each end of the cross. And there is some sort of a sphere in dotted lines. But if you look more closely, the dotted lines of the sphere become confused with the lines of the right angles. And anyway, some of the right angles are drawn by dotted lines. And again, is it, is it, is it a, a, a cross-shaped floor? Or are these dotted lines in the bottom corner actually going down? Is this like a kind of Escher where they go down in reverse? Like, is it actually a sphere with all these things hanging on each other? Again, I show you the same drawing upside down because there's no correct way to see it. Couldn't we see it as a set of walls that become dotted lines, again, somehow enabled by a sphere? And I think this is, this is the, uh, uh, let's say the kind of architecture of, of Meta Clark. It is an architecture of destabilizing assumptions about what constitutes uh, architecture. It is a totally dotted architecture. It's perforated, one passes uh, through. Um, he argues many times that the thing that you pass through is not what it is until you pass through it, and it's not the same as it was before you, uh, after you leave it. So it's a very kind of transactional, very kind of contagious idea and very uh, uh, destabilized idea of what constitutes, uh, uh, let's say, architecture. But of course, as a member of the Architects' Union, I want to insist that it is never anything other than architecture. And the challenge that, that Meta Clark poses to us is to sort of deeply, deeply accept uh, the thought that architecture is biological. And if, if just in like two seconds, you know every second architect, every second word out of the mouth is that architecture is some kind of biology. This is, this is an enormous history. But it could be that this is just a kind of, as, as uh, Donald Trump would say, aspirational comment that architecture would be biology. We may be able to find some architects, and they are architects by virtue of this, that really thought of architecture in biological terms and their work was generated by that. And this is the, this is the uh, architect I favored. Meta Clark uh, died in, you know, literally shortly after doing the project in Chicago. He worked as an artist slash architect for only 10 years. So you're looking at a 10 years of laboratory work on the idea of, um, of a kind of bio biological understanding of architecture. But I think he earned our uh, respect. And I think respect would be to try to think of this work not in terms of, terms of the normal categories of art and architecture, uh, normal distinctions of biology, and also even to rethink, let's say, a kind of ecological um, uh, ways of operating. In short, I'm a fan of Meta Clark, um, in love with Meta Clark, uh, which for me to be in love with something or someone means not to know what you're in love with. Uh, but to know that you'd be unhappy uh, without it. And I think to a certain extent, uh, architecture would be unhappy without Meta Clark. And, and this is to me, let's say even more so in this moment, I notice that people now reach out, like people that you haven't seen for a while, reach out to make sure you're okay. Uh, it seems to me we have to reach out to figures like Meta Clark in this moment and just make sure that they're uh, okay. Okay, so any questions? I go to the chat. I think you should all turn your video on anyway. It's kind of desperately lonely just to see your name. Hi. So Hala, you have a question? Yes, I do. I was Good. trying to type it. I'm, I'm, I didn't really form the question in my head yet, but yeah. um, I was wondering, all of this was very inspirational and interesting. And how can we, how can we take that and implement it in 
real functioning buildings? Or is, it, is that the point of this art? You know, hey Ben, I, I think, um, I mean, of course, you know, I'm a teacher, right? So I'm bound to say to you, that's for you to decide, right? Uh, um, so yeah, it's for you to decide. Um, but you know, when, just when you said functioning buildings, I would immediately sort of say, okay, what do we think we mean by functioning buildings? And I think if you would describe really what you think a functioning building is, I think your words would start to sound like Matt Clark's description of the building as a kind of living organism. You know, if you read Le Corbusier and all the other monsters, yeah, they, they talk about architecture as a machine and as an organism, so some kind of cybernetic uh, organism, but they really don't like bacteria and they don't like uh, insects and they don't like women, by the way. Uh, they don't, you know, they, 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 like, they hate so much and they love order themselves. And, and so they, they, they really, they speak the language of biology, but actually they speak a eugenics language. In, in the case of, of, of uh, Le Corbusier, he was a eugenicist, was ex explicitly anti-Semitic uh, uh, genetic engineer, you know. So, so, so two signs here, right? One, as I say, watch out when any, anybody mentions the word biology because people might start to die uh, and architecture might become more boring. What I think that, that Matt Clark is helping us to understand is there's another way, very sort of simple way of just thinking of architecture as itself, let's say a system of contamination. Like why do those of us living in New York, we live here because we want to be contaminated. That's the whole point of being here is density. Now, now the very reason for us to be here is demonized as a, as a, as a, as a health risk. But I think that, I think that what Matt Clark is trying to, you know, with, without that risk, uh, by the way, without bacteria, we die. So, so I think medical is just, my teacher's answer to you would be, okay, even that word function, we could, we could think about that again. Like, what, couldn't you say that the function of architecture is to host a multiplicity of species uh, in complex ways that we don't understand nor want to understand? In the same way, we don't want to know everybody in New York. We want to know that we don't know everybody. We want to be with people we don't know, don't understand, and see what happens. So what if architecture is a form of hospitality? We could say function means being, being hospitable, being, being you know, open to the, to the unknown. So we can change that word function, but you can see, if you ask me a question, I could talk for two hours, it's a risk. I promise the next question will be a, a 30 second answer. Who's next? I hardly see any of your faces, which is a pity. You do have the opportunity to unmute yourself now yeah. um, and you can turn on your camera if you'd like. So Antonia, you have the best background. <laughs> what are you up to? I do. This is the north of Chile and the desert. Unbelievable. It's Atacama. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Yes. I'm completely I was jealous of the background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can look it up online. It's on Google. Yeah. Any questions about this? All yeah. biological thing? Uh, I was thinking it's fascinating because of all the talks now about density and like, should we move, move to the suburbs? Like, should we run for our lives? And then we're like, no, like the city is the greatest thing. Like, it's the reason we came here. It's, it's yeah. so human. So, I mean, other than like reasoning with people, how do we approach it? Like, how do we argue for density on the city right now? Yeah, I don't, again, I don't want to be, I think it's interesting to think about the history of that. Um, the city that we live in, uh, like most cities um, in the so-called North, have, has actually been designed by sanitation protocols. So actually the whole city you see is already organized by regimes of, to control uh, disease. So um, this experience, which, uh, uh, the idiot president says nobody could ever have imagined. Not only it is actually the, the, the life of cities has been this. 19th century was the great year, years of, of so-called sanitary reform. So, so it could suggest that you know, the new techniques of sanitary reform will uh, emerge. It's very likely that, that we develop some new protocols and that those protocols eventually have to change because of some other kind of uh, threat. So, I, and, and one thing I can tell you in the 19th century, when 
when there was this huge sanitation reform movement, architects were really involved uh, in the thinking, in the ideas, and in the designing. So I, I, feel, I feel pretty sure that our um, community will get involved. They were never the leaders, uh, and we don't need to be the leaders, but I think that there, there was a lot of reflection about that. And one, one argument you can make is that what we think of as 20th century architecture, modern architecture, is the kind of result of all of that work. There's nothing new there. It's really, it's been produced by a hundred years of debate about light and air and, 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 and so on. So if you take that kind of perspective, who knows what happens next, but you're absolutely right that we, we those of us who love cities feel uh, threatened. Um, and it's very upsetting to look at a map of the, of the United States and see that the infections kind of match the political votes of the country like, and match urbanism versus non-urbanism. So this is an old argument. Um, Americans ran away to the suburbs because of nuclear war. Suburbs may be the single worst and single, be single most successful export of the United States. I would hate to think that we invent another horror, um, horror show. I, I don't know. There's, this, there's another view, by the way, that says, yeah, okay, once they find the vaccine, um, we, we all forget, like, like uh, we forget every terrible thing that happens. I mean, I, I actually think in a certain sense that I'm more worried about that. I'm more worried that our field will, you know, happily do stuff for real estate developers in the future with, with, that will make everybody happy. Mark, we have a question that has arrived to us in the chat. Um, yeah asking uh, what architects and artists are using or have used Mata Clark as an inspiration or a starting point for uh, great, great, research more. Yeah, great question. Um, all of them. <laughs> no, you, I, it's an easy test, right? Whenever you meet an artist, just ask them, what do they think about Mata Clark? And they get really emotional. Uh, he's, and, and the artists you're talking to can be super young, can be students can be recent graduates, can be the coolest cats in the universe, or can be, you know, 80 year old, you know, blue chip uh, artists. You'll never meet somebody that says, oh, I don't know, overrated. Um, there's something about, and you know, maybe living for only 10 years is an advantage, of course, but I think mainly what he did was change the, this is where I think he has this connection with Duchamp. He, he's playing an important role in changing what we think art could be, right? So just to give you a simple example, you know, he, a big thing for him was cooking because he was all about hospitality, right? So cooking, you don't make an artwork, you make a dinner and then you invite all your friends as artists to come to that dinner. That's the, uh, that's the artwork. Now, if I just say, I want to I wanna look at all the artists who over the last 40 years made cooking their central activity or hospitality their central activity, it's a huge number. Right? So I think it's, he, he's, um, maybe I should give you a slightly better answer. He is fundamentally a conceptual artist, like he works with ideas. Just because it's very material and he's very physical and kind of even, you could say, sweaty, um, it's all about ideas. And those ideas, uh, and he was probably, um, he was not very famous during his life. I mean, really not. Um, uh, when, he did, when, he, when he did the the project in Chicago, he was interviewed and he said, I have to tell you, this is the first time I have been exhibited by an institution in the United States. And he was very moved. He says, I'm very moved. And then he quickly said, but you know, I'm anti-institution and I hate institutions, but there was this, you know, he really felt, um, it's not just that his father never uh, showed any love, but because you know, it tends to be what fathers do, I mean, not do. Um, it's that no one did. So I think he was, he was, looking for it. He wanted to be successful. He wanted to sell works of art, was always obsessed about galleries. He was not like anti-art market, anti-gallery. Um, but in truth, he never, never received success. So all of this has happened after his death. Um, and so for some reason, for me, the story is not so much, hey, Mata Clark, a super interesting artist. We should, uh, you know, uh, uh, think about the work. It's more the question, why is that figure so important to all of us? Like, what, in, why do we need such a uh, figure? There are many other figures as well. But in answer to your question, and on the architect side, oh yeah, it's a really love-hate thing with, uh, with Matt Clark for architects, because he's just too good. Um, so um, some people say that, for example, the, um, uh, Dan Graham, the artist, uh, 
uh, said that Michael Graves' early work, the Benassarov House in, in Princeton, is totally coming from, from Meta Clark. And I think that Michael Graves ad admitted that. I think their uh, architects are basically deeply threatened. Um, most architects you meet will say that they love Meta Clark, but they would never dare do anything like this. You know, how many architects do you know whose work smells bad? I mean, really smells bad. So we, whatever you can say architecture is, it's clean. Right? Getting back to that question about hygiene, we, we have absorbed this sort of hygienic understanding. With Meta Clark, uh, it could smell, uh, it could fall, uh, it could disappear. Uh, it could be what it was not supposed to be. Uh, I, I think we don't have that kind of courage. And maybe it's more difficult. Maybe the responsibilities of architects are different. Anyway, any other thoughts? I think um, normally I don't interject my own questions into yeah, these but shoot. things, Mark. Um, something that I was thinking a lot about while you were speaking that I haven't thought about before, actually, in relation to Mata Clark is Eva Hesse. Yes. Um, you know, who was about 10 years older, um, you know, died just a decade before, but also was this sort of like very young artist aware that she was dying and also making these sort of... Um, yeah natural versus unnatural assemblages. And I'm sort of interested in, do you have any thoughts ab about that? The sort of this uh, connection or disconnection between them yeah. And works? Yeah, I think he, I think that Ava Hess was a very, very um, important figure for Matt Clark and very influential. I'm sorry, I forget the name, but she made one installation in the gallery, which was a very kind of, it was kind of a sort of biological network of kind of latex, it was like a spider's web. Yes. Um, and, and that project is, is really, really close in time to when Meta Clark is hanging these uh, vines in the uh, mm -hmm. uh, gallery. So I think she's, she's a key, is a key um, uh, uh, reference for him. And, and I, in, in that book I did, I talk a little bit about the, the, the artists, particularly the woman artists that, are, that had such a, an influence. Mm -hmm. I think at that time, um, there was a lot of sharing of ideas and a lot of cross fertilization in this, in this sort of new generation. And Ava Hess was, as you pointed out, was actually kind of like more successful than most. So she was sort of, uh, actually that made, that made for some jealousies and some anger. Right, had a little bit of fame in her time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I think that the idea of, a, of making something in the gallery that, that looked like it doesn't really belong of course, this has a relationship again back to Duchamp hanging the string, you know, like again, um, making sure that when you enter a room, the room is no longer a room. Right. And I, and I think this is, you know, this is a very simple way of saying what, what uh, Medeclerc does. It, it, it a little bit connects to the previous question because I think when, when architects find ways in what you expect it to happen doesn't really happen, uh, an element of architecture starts to behave Kind of irrational or, or irresponsibility. This, this is where I think uh, figures like Meta Clark come up. I, I think it would be, of course, super boring for people to cut buildings like Meta Clark cuts buildings. I, I think for me, to be influenced by Meta Clark is to be is 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 to maybe absorb this more kind of biological and biotechnological um, view. It's a little bit cosmic, um, and, and in that sense, he he. He, uh, had, he did have that kind of a cosmic, um, kind of co cosmic kind of attitude. You know, for him, architecture is like a very delicate, fragile set of membranes suspended in unbelievably dense, overlapping flows of many, many kinds. So he has kind of like the inverse of our normal feeling. We think of architecture kind of solid and everything else kind of uh, liquid. He thought of architecture as 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 like uh, hanging in a spider's web very, very delicate. This, this is what I mean. This is why I think these drawings of the plants are so important. He, he's trying to make architecture delicate. And when it's delicate, it's reactive, responsive. Um, and it's also, you know, at, at one level, kind of a, a sort of a sexual thing in the sense of uh, it's about a confusion of the body and the building and the nature, everything, you know, it's a kind of interspecies uh, intimacy. Of course, I'm speaking this very romantic language, uh, a language of love, I guess. I, I, I think this, and th this is where I think 
his work was coming from. Mm. Mm. So um, there's a final question here, which I feel yeah. could certainly take us on a tangent, um, whether or not um, uh, Madakar ever met uh, Buckminster Fuller or if they interacted. Oh, what a great question. I have no idea. Um, of course, the circumstances would likely be Cornell, um, uh, but we would have to check the years uh, because because Buckminster Fuller hang out hang out quite a lot at Cornell and in Cornell he worked with the students on very very temporary kind of emergency structures actually structures that were intended for disadvantaged uh, uh, populations there was a big collaboration going on with Chile precisely at that moment and they were making kind of portable shelters and um, in the back of my cerebral cortex, there's a little light that's going off that says that, yes, there was a, um, some piece of evidence I've seen that Matt Clark was aware of those experiments. Probably it means I was in the archive and I saw he had a, a document or something like that. In terms of dialogue, I don't know, but I think it's a, a wonderful question. I mean, there are two monsters. Um, so it's a bit like celebrity deathmatch or whatever. I'd be curious to know if they... I mean, uh, why I think it's a, such a sharp question is if, if you would say to me, ask me a question with something like, who has the most, who has had the most radical ecological view in architecture? Like, you know, a, an understanding of ecology and architecture's intimacy with ecology that is so kind of deep that you have to think again about everything. I would name um, uh, Fuller and um, uh, and and. And Matt Clark, may, maybe also Patrick Geddes, uh, you know, from the beginning of the century, and a few other figures. We could start to build up a, a, a list. And in that sense, they are kind of a hypothetical, uh, it's a hypothetical Zoom meeting that they could have with each other. <laughs> Again, you know, with, with, with um, Fuller, very cosmic, you know. Just to f finish you with a little narrative, he promised his wife, he was a super unfaithful, by the way, Fuller slept with every dog, person, piece of technology there is, but somehow uh, revered his wife in what some people call a kind of Madonna complex. But he promised her that, uh, that he would be with her when he died. And he was giving a lecture and he was told that she'd gone to the hospital. And he went to the hospital, had to travel, had to fly to get there, said hello to her, held her hand, put her head on the end of the bed and died. Um, and she died like six hours later. Um, so, uh, these cosmic types, you've got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs>